Hello and welcome everybody to this XPS for Beginners course run by Harwell XPS. I'm Mark Isaacs and uh, I'm going to be introducing you to uh, the fundamentals and getting you started on learning some of the theory and background behind how XPS works as a technique and as a process and just give you a little bit of a, a, a baseline to work on for when we come to look at how to interpret our data, how to process some of our spectra and, and get the most out of our XPS results. So this is going to be the first part of our fundamentals section. Do check out some of the examples and questions afterwards as well. Hopefully that will give you a bit of a chance to um, get some hands-on use with some of the things we're going to talk about and just help you kind of build up your, your kind of knowledge and appreciation for XPS as a technique. So we'll get started. And this first talk is going to be on just some of the absolute fundamentals of XPS. So we're going to be looking at what is the photoelectric effect relationship? Where does this come from? How does this work? Uh, what does an XPS spectrum look like? And what are the basic parts of an XPS spectrum? And what affects peak intensity? So some real uh, base level stuff to uh, to kickstart our XPS course. So the photoelectric effect, you probably will have come across this before at some point, but if not, don't worry, we're going to go through it all. So this really comes from some observations made a very long time ago. So Heinrich Hertz in the 1880s looked at um, some interactions with radiation and matter and noticed that uh, under certain conditions uh, radiations um, could produce sparks in, in metals. And then as the years went on this was later explained by Albert Einstein who won his Nobel Prize for his work on the photoelectric effect and the description of this process involved. And what he discovered was that the relationship between the radiation and the, the matter is as such. So when you shine radiation on a sample you produce these photoelectrons and the resultant kinetic energy of those photoelectrons is equal to the radiation of our incoming, um, the energy of our incoming radiation, sorry, so this HV you can see in our diagram and the um, the binding energy of our atom of our electrons are inside this atom so the energy which holds the electron in place so uh, we do have one final term which is called a work function and uh, this goes on to explain uh, just one final little energy penalty so when we're talking about solid state materials uh, we've got a couple of energy levels we need to kind of define here one of these is the Fermi level so this is the highest electronic level um, when you are, when the system is at absolute zero and then there's also this evac level so this is the the vacuum level and this is when the electron is at rest and removed from the influence of the atom so this small energy penalty to remove the electron from the Fermi energy up to the vacuum level is called the work function now there is another instrument work function and um, we're not going to talk about this now this will be covered later on in the course when we talk about some of the experimentation and, uh, and instrumentation of the XPS. Uh, so we'll have a quick look at our first XPS spectrum. So this is just some pure gold. Uh, it's a very nice spectrum. We can see lots of detail in here and you can see there's, there's quite a few peaks in there. So it's not just one peak we're looking at. We don't just see this is a gold peak. Um, we're looking at uh, quite a few here and that's because we are actually looking at electronic orbitals. So one of the other things that you'll notice first is that uh, when we look at our x-axis we're going from uh, high binding energy to low. So this is just a bit of a legacy uh, factor in that XPS spectra used to be um, processed in terms of kinetic energy so you would have your zero kinetic energy on the left up to uh, your in this case 1200 EV on the right and then when this was converted to binding energy the um, spectra were kept in the same direction just to keep things consistent so now we plot from high binding energy to low so whenever you are kind of presenting your XPS spectra publishing it uh, just remember that the x-axis is, is reversed. We've got a stepped background so as you can see after each peak we've got uh, an increase in the overall level of the background we're going to come onto this in one of the next parts of this course and yeah, we can see we can see a couple of peaks. There's not just one peak, as I said. So um, we need to figure out what these peaks are. So if we look from uh, low binding energy to high, 
we are kind of going from the outside of our atom in. So right around zero EV, roughly, we've got our valence electrons. And as we move down our spectrum, we've got um, some gold 4F electrons. We've got some gold 5S, 4D, 4P, 4S. So these are all of the electronic orbitals uh, that are below the valence level in our atom. And what we're doing when we produce this um, survey XPS spectrum is we're exciting all of these electronic orbitals and quantifying how many electrons are associated with each orbital. And again, these peaks have different intensities. So this is related to a couple of different factors, such as the uh, efficiency of the removal of the photoelectrons as well as the um, multiplicity of the electrons there. So if we have a look at something else, so that's obviously a single atom, a single element, sorry, um, and we can see that we've got all of the peaks we expected there for our gold orbitals. Um, but if we start looking at things like compounds or systems where we've got more elements than one, uh, we can start to see how XPS can be used to produce uh, data and results that help us understand our materials better. So here's some um, PVP, polyvinyl pyrrolidone, uh, just a simple polymer. And we can see three major peaks around 300, 400 and 500. And what we can determine is that these three peaks are different elements. So we have our, our valence orbitals again at zero and then the the next set of peaks we're observing are going to be core levels. So the peaks we observe in XPS are predominantly core level, so filled uh, electron subshells. And this is what gives us all of our information. So when we have lighter elements, we saw with gold, we've got a lot of peaks there because it's quite a heavy element. There's a lot of um, different shells and subshells. But when we come to lighter elements, because we don't have quite so many core levels, we don't have so many peaks. So in this example, we have carbon, oxygen and nitrogen. And we've only actually got one peak for each one. There's a few um, peaks that you can see in higher energies. And we'll touch on what these are uh, later on. But our main sharp peaks here, we can see three. One for carbon, one for nitrogen, one for oxygen. Uh, and that's because we only have one core level. We've got our 1s core level. And then the rest of the electrons in our system are valence electrons. So one of the ways that it can be quite useful to think about XPS spectra is like an energy level diagram. Uh, so this is some copper metal. And if we turn our spectra 90 degrees, we can now start to look at this as if it's a traditional energy level diagram. We can ignore the peaks in the middle for now. So these are called Auger electrons. Uh, and we will cover these in detail later on in the course. So don't worry too much about those for now. But as we can see, when we go from a high binding energy, we're looking at our electrons, which are buried much deeper in the atom. So our 2s up to our 2p, then our 3s, 3p, and finally our valence electrons. So these 2p, 2s electrons are closer to the core and they are bound by a higher binding energy. Now, of course, this is a bit of a simplified view because we're not actually studying <clears throat> a ground state but we are studying an excited state at the end because there are um, final state effects and other recombination processes that happen during the measurement. Uh, but it's still, nonetheless, it is a good way to kind of just think about the XPS spectra and, and get you used to uh, looking at them and figuring out what exactly you are looking at. So here is a plot of some uh, binding energies and how they relate to the different uh, orbitals and atomic numbers. So what you can see is that the uh, this energy level kind of profile that we've discussed now kind of holds up f throughout um, the periodic table. So as we go up here we can see that our 1s electrons are almost always um, lower, in, uh, higher in binding energy sorry, than our, our 2s and our 2p and so on and so on. So we follow these profiles up and uh, you can see that this um, energy level diagram um, visualization that we've that we're discussing now holds true for uh, four atoms all the way up to high um, atomic numbers. <clears throat> now it doesn't necessarily correlate perfectly with the alpha principle, um, 
and it does ignore some things such as the symmetry effects and correlation energy um, but it never, nevertheless it is a, a good method just by which to think about XPS spectra and and just kind of uh, get an appreciation for what you're looking at uh, so don't treat it as um, you know the gold uh, the gold standard or anything it's just a nice way for you to visualize what's going on so we're going to talk a little bit about peak intensity now and what affects the um, the height and the intensity of the peak so there are a number of factors so we have our x-ray flux our elemental concentration our photoionization cross-section and our spectrometer angular acceptance and transmission function as well as an inelastic mean free path now there are a few uh, experimental factors here so the x-ray flux we can um, we can control experimentally our spectrometer angular acceptance and transmission function are obviously both uh, experimental parameters as well so that leaves us with the elemental concentration which is usually what we are trying to find out photoionization cross-section which is a constant that we can uh, determine beforehand and our inelastic mean free path which again is another constant so what you should be able to see from this is that uh, the two changing or the two variables that are going to affect our intensity is the the flux of the x-ray so if we you know, in increase the power of our x-rays we're going to see a better signal and the elemental concentration so a little note on photoionization cross-sections. So I mentioned this is a constant, uh, and this basically describes the probability of an electron in a particular orbital to emit a photoelectron. Uh, and so things like symmetry and how close they are to the nucleus will define what value this cross-section takes. Uh, and it's also a function of excitation energy. So typically as we increase the excitation energy of our incoming radiation, we decrease the probability that we remove a photoelectron. There's a good resource which is going to be on the the page for this, so if you're uh, following this via Harvard XPS Guru rather than on YouTube, there will be an, a, an accompanying page where you can find things like resources and links, and there's there's a link to the uh, Electro Synchrotrone website in Trieste in Italy where they have uh, photo ionization cross-section calculators and you can produce plots such as this. So here we can see this is for carbon 1s. So as we increase our the energy of our incoming radiation, we're decreasing our, our cross section. Now, of course, you do still need to have enough energy to ionize the orbital in the first place. So this is a, just another nice visualization of the photoelectric effect itself. So for, for nickel 2p, if we have energy uh, incoming radiation below a certain energy, so this is about 870-ish, uh, we won't get any photoionization because uh, the energy is not high enough to overcome the binding energy of the nickel 2p. So we can see the onset of photo emission here and then again as we increase the energy more we start to decrease the efficiency of uh, photoelectron excitation. So finally a bit of a note on some uh, some of the things that affect peak width and shape as we go on further into this course it's going to become apparent that it can be quite important to um, have an understanding and appreciation for some of the peak shapes involved. So when you come to model your data, it can be quite uh, useful to just have a, a, a bit of a background in terms of um, what peak shapes are normal and what peak shapes are sensible. And, uh, it will just help you process your your spectra to a, to a bit of a higher quality. So the three things which affect the width and the distribution of the electron energies around the core emission, uh, we've got the spread of the x-rays. So this is uh, essentially a, a measure of how monochromated our, our x-rays are. So if we have a very broad energy spread of incoming radiation, we're obviously going to end up with quite a broad range of photoelectron energies. Whereas if we have a nice narrow uh, X-ray energy spread, such as those found at a synchrotron, then we're going to get some very nice and sharp peaks. So this typically gives us a bit of a Gaussian distribution. Spectrometer broadening, and this relates to instrument factors, which will further broaden your um, your peaks in terms of efficiency of analyzers and so on and so forth. And then finally, the intrinsic line width, which is a, a Lorentzian peak shape. 
So we'll end up with a kind of mix of Gaussian and Lorenzian peaks for our uh, XPS spectra. And uh, again, later on in the course, we'll go on into a bit more detail on how to model these. So the, uh, the fourth half maximum of our resultant peak can be described with the, the formula there at the top. And the intrinsic line width, as I mentioned, this Lorentzian relationship can be related to the core hole lifetime uh, as such. So we typically have core hole lifetimes are around 10 to the minus 13 to 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So the, the shorter this core hole lifetime, the broader the eventual peak is going to be. Uh, and these intrinsic line widths typically give us around 0 0.04 to 4 eV, depending on the, the orbital and the element uh, in, in question. So, in summary, uh, we have kinetic energy of photoelectrons directly related to a binding energy and the energy of the incoming radiation. When we look at XPS, we are probing core levels, so uh, underneath the valence band is typically what we're looking at. And we've, we've had a bit of a look at some peak intensity and peak width and how our experimental and intrinsic parameters affect both of those. So thank you for listening to this first session. And next up, we have another fundamental session and we're going to be looking a bit about chemical shifts and introducing Auger peaks, which I mentioned earlier in this one. So thank you and I will see you there.